Amen. I feel such a touch of the Holy Ghost here tonight. I just, I feel so comfortable. Acts chapter 2, verse number 1. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, we love these few verses. And these verses excite us, and they should. But there's, there's something more there. One thing that we need to understand about the book of Acts is the book of Acts church has an expanding nature to it. Uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, uttermost was never meant to be confined to just one location. You, your children, all that are afar off, even as many. The book of Acts church is an expanding, growing, enlarging church. And in these verses of Scripture, all of that started in an upper room. But I am convinced that it had nothing to do with the room and everything to do with what filled the room. I thank God for buildings. I thank God for architecture. I thank God for structure. But I believe that in this generation, we have, we have somewhere along the way begun to place a little too much emphasis on the building. It's not about the building, it's about the atmosphere. It's about the atmosphere. Brother Robinette, that's why you can go to a stadium where they're playing soccer all the other times of the year. But when apostolics show up, they carry an atmosphere. And 10,000 plus can be filled with the Holy Ghost. And so, I know where we're going to start. I don't really know where we're going to finish. We're just going to flow in the Holy Ghost tonight. Is that all right? Is that all right? And so I want to talk to you about apostolic atmospheres. Apostolic atmospheres. I'm going to just tell you what I'm feeling uh, just in talking. I've just been filling out the room. And I understand that there are some here, and I don't mean this rudely, but there are some here that have not been here the rest of the week. And those of us that have been here the majority of the week, We've, we've found this vein. We've found this flow. And I don't believe that it's the will of God to have to dig through a bunch of things that have been carried into this room by people that haven't been here all week. Distractions and, and, and things of that nature. So here's, here's what I feel in the Holy Ghost. We're, we're going to pray here in just a moment. And when we do, it is imperative that every person in this room Pray until you plug in to the flow of this service. I'm not here to be anybody's favorite preacher. I'm not here to sermonize or entertain. I'm here to flow in the Holy Ghost. And whenever we lift our hands and we pray, here's, here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray like you want to be a part of end time revival more than anything in this world. Can you do that? Anybody hungry for end time revival? <laughs> Let's lift our hands and lift our voices. We're going to take as long as we need. Come on. We shouted for the music and I thank God for it, but God wants to speak a word into this atmosphere. Don't worry about your neighbor. Don't worry about anybody around you. Lift your voice. Come on. Would you just pray in the Holy Ghost all over the house?
Come on, that's it. Why don't you shake this house with a prayer right now? Come on, lift your voice. Now, why don't you reach over and connect with your neighbor and let's agree in this house for what God's about to do in the next few moments. Come on. Come on. I need some intercessors to help me right now. Come on. Come on, we came to break something in this atmosphere. Now all across the building, would you put your hands together and just shout unto the Lord? Come on, like an army, would you shout unto God? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. God bless you. If you promise to help me preach here tonight, you can be seated. <clears throat> One of my favorite authors, who is a writer from the early 1800s, he made a very profound statement in one of the books that he wrote. He said that every man has an atmosphere which affects every other. He was saying that every individual has one atmosphere that sets the precedent for every other atmosphere in their life. And so the question that I want to ask Wynn's conference tonight is, is the atmosphere of the kingdom affecting the atmosphere of the culture or is the atmosphere of the culture affecting the atmosphere of the kingdom? Is the atmosphere of your church affecting the atmosphere of your city? Or is the atmosphere of your city affecting the atmosphere of your church? To bring it a little closer to home, is the atmosphere of your job or your school affecting the atmosphere of your prayer closet? Or is the atmosphere of your prayer closet affecting the atmosphere of your job or your school? I believe it is the will of God that the atmosphere of the kingdom sets the precedent for every other atmosphere in the world. I flew to Canada earlier this year for their youth convention in Ontario, and they had already lifted the mask mandate here in the U.S. when it came to flying, where flying was concerned. And I was a little taken back when I got on the plane in Philadelphia, which was the last leg of the trip into Canada. I was a little taken back when I got on the plane and they asked us to put on our masks, even though we were on U.S. soil. And when I got on the plane in Canada, headed back to the U.S., they didn't ask us to put on our masks. And I came to realize afterward that 
the moment you step on the jet bridge of a plane, you have just entered the atmosphere of your destination. And when you enter the atmosphere of your destination, you have to submit to the authority of your destination. In this generation, we don't operate in the atmosphere of where we are, but we have tasted of the good word of God. And we operate in the powers of the world to come. I am seeing young men and young women in this generation that have a keen awareness of the spirit realm. I want you to understand tonight that the created world is not the real world. The real world is the spirit world. It existed long before time and creation. And it is imperative that in this hour God raises up a generation that is plugged in to what the eye cannot see. And what the ear cannot hear. And what the nose cannot smell. And what the mouth cannot taste. And what the hands cannot feel. And in 2019... December of 2019, the Lord spoke to me very clearly and said that I am about to bring prophets out of the caves. And I began to preach that everywhere I went, and out of nowhere, the world shuts down in March of 2020. And when you study your Bibles, you'll find out, make no mistake about it, you may not op operate in the office of a prophet, but we are a prophetic people. It is interwoven into our spiritual DNA. And beginning in March of 2020, we began to deal with a certain spirit, and it was the spirit of fear. And whenever you study your Bible, you will find out that when the spirit of Jezebel wants to hinder the move of the prophetic, she will always release the spirit of fear. I understand that COVID was very real. It was a real sickness. It, it devastated many churches. It devastated many families. I'm not undermining that. But at the same time, we cannot be so naive to think that there was not a spiritual implication in what took place. I wholeheartedly believe that it was a reaction from the spirit world because the enemy knew God's about to reach into the caves and bring out prophetic voices. <clears throat> and since 2020, I've begun to meet that 7,000 that refused to bow a knee to Baal. God has begun to bring out of the caves young men and young women that are truly prophets and seers among us. And it's like since 2020, there was an acceleration that was placed on this generation. There are apostles and prophets, evangelists and pastors and teachers that are not even out of high school yet. And I want to say very boldly here tonight, we don't have time to wait until they're in their 40s and their 50s before we release them to operate as who and what God has called them to be. But I feel the Holy Ghost reaching down in this generation and elevating nameless people that don't want the credit that don't want to be on the highlight reel, that are not looking for the platform. They just want apostolic authority. And there is an acceleration on this generation. And I believe completely that it is because of the urgency of the hour that we are living in. We're not in the first hour. We're not in the second hour. We're not in the third hour. We are in the 11th hour. And I would dare even say we are in the final few moments of the 11th hour. And it is time for the magnitude and the weight of the hour to rest on this generation's shoulders. <clears throat> and so God is accelerating this generation. This generation is operating 
in giftings and anointings that generations before us did not plug into until their 40s and their 50s. It has nothing to do with us, and it has everything to do with the hour that we are living in. And the angel of the Lord showed up to Zacharias, and he began to prophesy to him about a prophetic voice that would be birthed in his house. And he began to speak to him and said, you're going to name this prophet John. And he's going to have a very specific role. He said he is going to be a forerunner for the Most High. He is going to be the prophet of the Most High God. And he will go forth in the spirit and power of Elijah. Can I tell you that John went forth in the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare the atmosphere for the first coming of Jesus Christ. But this generation will also go forth in the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare the atmosphere for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Does anybody believe that in this house? Come on, does anybody believe you are the final generation? <clears throat> and when you read in Isaiah 40, that prophet began to prophesy. And he said, you're going to hear a voice crying out in the wilderness. And he said, when you begin to hear that voice, I want you to pay attention. Because every mountain and hill is going to be brought low. Every valley is going to be exalted. Every rough place is going to be made plain. And every crooked path is going to be made straight. And when the resistance is moved out of the way by that prophetic voice, the glory of the Lord is going to be revealed to humanity. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. It was the job of that prophetic generation to prepare the atmosphere for the greatest visitation that the world had ever seen. He was the forerunner for Jesus Christ. And when you study a forerunner that has Old Testament roots, because the Bible said that the hand of the Lord was upon Elijah, and he, he accelerated, God accelerated him, and he outran King Ahab into the city of Jezreel. He beat a chariot. He outran the horses and the chariots into the city. And the reason is, is because he had to beat the king to the city to let the city know that the king is on the way. And that's why God has accelerated this generation is because we've got to go into all the earth as prophetic people and let them know that the king is on the way. I don't believe it's the will of God for you to leave this conference and go home with your mouth shut. But I believe God's going to send you with an acceleration to let your city know, to let your church know, to let your family know, to let your college campus know that the king is on the way. And, and what has begun to happen since 2020? I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost, what has begun to happen since 2020 is there has been a transfer of that prophetic ministry and that prophetic role from generation to generation. And there's some unfinished business from the last two generations that God's going to use this generation to complete in this hour. Because the Lord spoke to Elijah and he said, Elijah, I want you to go and I want you to anoint Jehu as the next king of Israel. But when you study the life of that great prophet, you will find out that Elijah was carried away in the, in the fire in the chariot before he could complete that task. And then that prophetic ministry shifts to Elisha. And you see where Elisha, he gets too old and weak to make the journey to Ramoth Gilead, which literally means the high place of Gilead. He's too old and weak to make the journey to the high place to anoint Jehu and finish the unfinished business of the generation before him. So what does Elisha do? In 2 Kings chapter 9, the Bible said that he called for a young nameless prophet. And he said, I want you to gird up your loins. Why did he tell him to gird up his loins? It's because he wanted that next generation to understand the 
the hour that we are living in, it will not allow you to walk with this assignment. You've got to run with this assignment. And so he says, I want you to gird up your loins and I want you to take this box of oil and I want you to go to the high place and anoint Jehu as the next king of Israel. And watch what the Bible says in 2 Kings 9 and verse number 4. It says, so the prophet, even the young man, the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. Look at the wording that the writer used there. He said, the prophet, even the young man, the prophet went to Ramoth Gilead. It's like the writer was saying, we would have expected Elijah to do it. Or we would have expected Elisha to do it. But because of the urgency of the hour, even the young man is going to carry the anointing to a higher place than it's ever been before. And I feel the Holy Ghost saying to this generation, we would have expected T.W. Barnes to do it. We would have expected James Kilgore to do it. We would have expected Lee Stone King and Billy Cole to do it. We would have expected J.T. Pew to do it. We would have expected Nona Freeman and Vesta Mangan to do it. And I honor those elders. But because of the urgency of the hour, even the young man, you're going to carry the anointing to a higher place than it's ever been before. I wish you'd shout in this house and say, when I go home, I'm not going to walk with the oil. I'm going to run as fast as I can. i got to let the world know the king is on the way. I wish you'd shout in this house right now and let God know I'm not going to take my time. I'm going to run as fast as I can. And we've been hearing a lot of preaching, and I thank God for it, about the timing that we are in. You have been brought into the kingdom for such a time as this. I would even venture to say that God has literally waited on this generation to get here before he releases the greatest revival that the world has ever seen. Do you understand who you are in Jesus Christ in this hour? Uh, and, and, and speaking of timing, there are different words in the Bible that are used to describe the word time. You have chronos and you have keros. Chronos, uh, it, 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 if I could paint a picture for you, chronos, uh, it, it's talking about chronological order. It's talking about the days and the weeks uh, and the months and the years. Uh, and it moves along effortlessly throughout time. Uh, it moves along in a horizontal manner. But then you have have Keros. It doesn't flow horizontally. And it's not the days and the weeks and the months of the years, but it is Keros. It is a divine season. It is an orchestrated appointment by God. And it does not move horizontally. It always comes down vertically. And it is disruptive in nature. Can I preach to you here today and say that there are some that believe uh, that this end time revival will just seamlessly weave itself uh, into the chronos, uh, into the flow of history, and will be able to stay comfortable and operate in religious tradition. Uh, but when Jesus went preaching the kingdom, uh, he said the time, uh, the taros, uh, is at hand, uh, and the kingdom is here. Can I tell you here today that this end time revival, it will disrupt every status quo. It will break the box of every religious tradition. It will shift ideologies. It'll go beyond your race, your language, your family. It'll go beyond your city. It's bigger than a building. It's about an atmosphere. You want to shout in this house right now and say, God, we want you to disrupt everything we know. Why don't somebody break the box uh, with their shout right now?
Uh, but, but I want you to understand something. I want you to understand something about the way that our God works. Our God is not a God that functions in the middle of chaos. But he will always take the chaos and bring order to it. He is a God of order. He is a God of structure. And he is a God of alignment. But I am afraid that in Pentecost we have structured the moving of the Holy Ghost out of too many of our church services. I said, I am afraid that in Pentecost uh, we have structured uh, and we have educated too much of the moving of the Holy Ghost uh, out of our church services. Or we're too worried about singing our solo and hitting the final point in our message. Uh, but when that wind begins to blow, you got to get the structure and the order of service out of the way and let God do what only God can do. That's why I believe that this is not just another meeting, Brother Myers. And I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost, this meeting is a hinge meeting for our movement. It is a hinge meeting for our movement because this church has learned how to allow structure and spirit to marry. They've got a structure. They've got an order of service. But when that wind begins to blow, they always follow the rustling of the leaves. <laughs> And so he is a God of structure. Why do you think God created man and woman and then released his glory? He created man, which represents authority, and then woman, which represents submission. And when there was submission to authority, he released his glory into the earth for the very first time. Why do you think in the Old Testament tabernacle, those priests couldn't just waltz into the Holy of Holies? Uh, there was a protocol they had to follow. They went to the outer court and then the holy place uh, and then in the whole, most holy place uh, and they got access to the glory. Why do you think Paul, before he ever spoke uh, about the gifts of the Spirit, he said you got to have church order and church government. And when you get that right, uh, you can get a release of the Spirit. Can I tell this generation, uh, I thank God for excellence I thank God for structure I thank God for an order of service but it was never meant to restrict God it was meant to release God there ought to be somebody that shouts and says when I go to my local church it doesn't matter if it's the offering or pre-service prayer when the wind begins to blow God can fill somebody with the Holy Ghost when he gets ready to fill somebody with the Holy Ghost why don't you disrupt this service right now with a shout and let God know we don't just want good church. We want the miracles. We want the miraculous. We want the gifts of the Spirit. a generation that'll lift their voice and say we are not satisfied with just good church we're not looking for the talent we're not concerned with the stage design we thank God for it but more than all of that we just want the wind to blow we just want the atmosphere we just want the blinded eyes to open we just want the lame to walk You want to know why we need to operate in an atmosphere? Because signs don't follow a building. I said signs don't follow a building. Signs follow them that believe. And that means wherever a believer goes, signs ought to be following you everywhere you go. God wants to bring this generation back to the dimension, Brother Robinette. While Peter yet spake the word, they don't have to lay hands on anybody, and I believe in the doctrine of laying on of hands. But in this hour, you cannot physically get to everybody. we got to get back to that atmosphere. While the preacher is preaching, blinded eyes can be opened. 
Deaf ears can be unstopped. Addictions can be broken. As a matter of fact, I command you to be healed right now in the name of Jesus Christ. I command your deaf ear to unstop. I command your paralysis to be healed in Jesus' name. I feel the gift of faith in this house. Hey, but listen to me. God can heal you right now without anybody laying their hand on your head. I'll prove it to you. I was preaching in Maryland earlier this year, and the gift of faith swept into the building a lot like it is right now. And there was a young lady that ran down to the front. When she was six years old, she was hit by a car, and she was totally deaf in her left ear. She had been deaf in her left ear for 20 years. But when she got connected to the atmosphere, nobody had to lay hands on her. She just lifted her hands and believed God would do it. And God opened up that deaf ear. You can shout right now and God can heal your body. You can dance right now and God can fix your marriage. You can praise God now. Give God a praise like it's already done. We're going to break some stuff in the spirit world here tonight. You hear what I'm telling you? We are going to break some stuff in the spirit world here tonight. Let me preach to the young ladies right now. You have a weapon of war that can shift the atmosphere everywhere that you go. Let me talk to you about the power of that uncut hair on your head. I felt a little kickback right there. You know what? I'm tired of the spirit of Jezebel jumping into, into the ear of this generation. You want to know why we've got men behind our pulpits uh, that don't want to say what God says to say? It's because they're more worried about being invited back uh, than being God's man. Uh, God didn't call you to get invited back. He called you to be obedient. I loose every preacher in this house. Uh, open your mouth and preach it. Don't worry about the favor of man. You just be God's man and he'll elevate you and open every door that needs to open. I wish this generation would shout right now and say, God, we just want to be your man and woman. Preach it, preach it, preach it, preach it. I'm sorry, I'm trying to move on from that right there. But when I preach about uncut hair at our youth camps, I don't even know why I'm on this. When I preach about uncut hair at our youth camps, it's not this generation that resists it. It's the generation before us that resists it. But I'm looking at a generation that says, we want that kind of preaching. We still believe that we're not letting go of it. There's power in it. I wish there'd be a mom and a dad that would rally with this generation right now and say there's power in that. Let's lift our hands all over the house.
But listen, I am, I am preaching. I know what I felt in prayer. I know what I felt in prayer. There are individuals in this room, you came here to feel a sense of liberty. But when you go back home, you've got a lot of resistance and a lot of opposition. Young ladies, I wanna to preach to you for just a moment because there truly is power in your uncut hair. And I feel this in the Holy Ghost. Something's gonna shift in this atmosphere here in just a moment. But when man, who is the image and the glory of God, fell in the garden, the glory was lost. And so what did God do? God said, I got to cover my glory. I got to protect it. So what did he do outside of the Garden Eden? He took those cherubims and he said, I'm going to place them here and they're going to be defenders of my glory. The Bible said that Lucifer, before he fell, he was the cherub that covered. He covered the glory of God. And above upon the mercy seat, there were two cherubims that covered the glory of God. You know what a cherubim is? It is a defender and a guardian of the glory of God. So when Paul began to address the church at Corinth and talk to those ladies about that uncut hair, he was saying, you've got guardian angels in your head. And when you go to your place of prayer, you are releasing those angels into the atmosphere and they are guarding the glory of your family. They're guarding the glory of your church. I wish every lady in this house uh, would lift those hands and go to battle right now. You gotta break the resistance uh, that you're fighting back home. Come on, young lady. You've got power with those angels. Uh. We're going to take a minute right here. Every lady in this house, let's lift our hands and let's pray. Let's pray. I want you to begin to go to battle right now. You've got some opposition back home where you're from. But I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost, uh, you can plug into something right now. And you can dispatch those angels back to your city. Yeah. Lift that voice of warfare, young lady. Go! All right, here we go. Listen to me for just a moment. Ladies, ladies, the men are about to join in with you. The men are about to join in with you. I'm telling you, something's about to, something's about to explode in the Holy Ghost in this room. It's already started. There's another layer to this. Listen to me. There's another layer to this. Because while the ladies cover the glory, I've noticed something traveling across our movement in our local churches and even at our youth camps. I've noticed that when a service is locked up, And it seems like nothing's happening. 
the men oftentimes sit back and they let the ladies do all the dancing, all the interceding, all the praying. And the excuse is that God wired them to be emotional, so that's just what they do. And the men sit back with their arms folded with our manly pride like we're too good for that. And it hinders the atmosphere. But you read your Bible in the Old Testament, it wasn't the women that put the ark on their shoulders and carried that glory to a place it had never been. It was the men that put the ark on their shoulder. It wasn't the women. It was the men that put the ark on their shoulder and carried the glory into a new atmosphere. So my question is, uh, how can we expect the women to cover it if the men don't carry it? But I believe there's a man in this house right now that'll say if the ladies are going to cover it, I'm going to shout when nobody else is shouting. I'm going to dance when nobody else. Every man and every woman, lift your voice and shout in this house right now. Come on, God's loosing angels. You ought to fight for your revival. You ought to fight for your family. You're releasing angels, and they're going from this place. Come on, men. Let God know you can trust me to carry the glory. If you're around the altar, keep praying. But those of you in your seats, I'm asking you to squeeze in around this altar. Would you step out of your seat? And would you hurry? Would you come to this altar? Would you come to this altar? Come on. Kindly, would you come? Would you hurry? Squeeze in around this altar. If you're around this altar, lift your hands and keep praying. Let's lift our hands and keep praying. Come on, that's it. That's it. Squeeze in as tight as you can. That's it, Joe Salamita. You can't see the drummer, but he's rolling on the floor right now. You ought to let God know you're desperate for this. You're desperate for revival. You're desperate for a breakthrough. Listen to me for just a moment. Listen to me for just a moment. I'm, I'm hastening. I'm hastening, but I have to tell you what I feel in the Holy Ghost. And then I'm, I promise I'm going to be very quick. And then I'm going to get out of the way. We're going to speak the word of faith. And we're going to go to battle for our revival here in just a moment. But I want you to listen to me for just a moment. This is what I felt very strongly in the Holy Ghost in prayer today. When Jesus stepped onto the shore of the Gadarenes... That man possessed with legion came to him. Jesus didn't have to go looking for him. Because true apostolic authority does not chase devils. Devils chase true apostolic authority. 
And when Jesus stepped into that territory, the spirits of that area exposed themselves to him. When a spirit exposes itself to you, that spirit is letting you know it recognizes you have authority over it. I just feel like preaching to some pastors in this house. You've been going home and you've been fighting some resistance and some opposition and you're wondering what's going on. I want you to lift your head up because the spirit of your area just lets you know it recognizes your authority. You know what? I'm going to deal with that little spirit of suicide right now. Because when I mentioned it yesterday in prayer, it's like we hit a brick wall and this thing just shut down. I'm going to be very careful here. I'm going to be very careful here. But I have to obey God. About a year ago, the Lord spoke to me and said that the spirit of suicide is attacking ministry. I woke up to a text the very next morning. I did not share that with anyone. I woke up to a text the very next morning. And a friend of mine said, the Lord spoke to me last night that the spirit of suicide is attacking ministry. I was driving down the road and I began to pray and ask God what this was all about and this is what he said to me. He said, the reason the spirit of suicide is attacking ministry far and wide is because too many have gotten to the place where they negotiate with the prince of their city. I'm telling you, we're going to conquer that thing in this room here tonight. Because watch this. When David fought Goliath, Goliath tried to negotiate. He said, if you beat me, then we'll serve you. But if we beat you, then you'll serve us. David never agreed to those terms and conditions. Because David was not sent into that area to negotiate with the giant. He was sent to conquer the giant. And when you negotiate with the prince of your city, you get to the place where you are controlled by what you should be conquering. But we're going to get victory in this house here tonight. And you're going to go home and drive out every giant that's trying to negotiate with you. And God's going to deliver you, minister. God's going to deliver you, pastor's wife. Let's lift our hands all over the house. Let's pray. You were not, not called to be controlled by it. You were called to conquer it. Speakers in ministry, if you would, come join me on the platform. If you would, speakers, come join me on the platform. Brother Robinette, Brother Gore, Brother Urshan, Brother Morgan, come join me on the platform. Brother Green. As these men come, here's what I'm going to leave you with. I'm done. I'm done. As these men come, here's what I'm going to leave you with. When Jesus confronted, the Bible said those spirits had been there a long time. There are ancient spirits that have ingrained themselves into your cities. They didn't show up overnight. They've been there a long time. It's the strong man. But here's what I feel for this conference and for ministries in this conference. When Jesus dealt with those ancient spirits... The man was delivered. He drove those spirits out of that city. And he looked at that man that was delivered and he said, go and tell everyone the good things the Lord has done. And where did he go? Decapolis. Ten cities. You better hear me in the Holy Ghost here tonight. When you deal with those ancient spirits in your city, it will open the door for a regional revival.
God's trying to shift our thinking in this hour away from just filling a building and into the dimension of taking regions with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Brother Robinette, I do believe billions are going to get the Holy Ghost, but not if we don't stop reaching for regional dominion. There ought to be a pastor just wave their hand right now and say, we don't want to just fill a building. We want regional revival. We want something that transcends architecture and it enters into an atmosphere. <laughs> Brother Green, God didn't call you to pastor that church just to build a building. He called you to take a region. And drive out those ancient spirits. I want every evangelist to hear me right now. God didn't call you just to fill a calendar. Don't ask me how far I'm booked up. I don't even keep a calendar. Because God did not send you to those churches just to preach a good message and get invited back. You need to go into that city and you need to address the spirit world. I feel a disruption coming to North America. It's not going to be done with sermonizing and good church. It's going to be done with an army that will shake the gates of hell. Somebody shout right now and say, I'm going home to take a region. All right, I, I promise you I'm done. I'm, I'm, here's, here's what I feel. I'm going to leave you with this, and I promise I'm done. Last year, the Lord called me to a time of consecration. Forgive the personal reference. I'm just I'm trying to get you to understand there's a price to pay for some things. The Lord called me to pay a certain price. And I went and preached for a man. And he prophesied to me. And I, I, some of you might not believe this, but I believe this. I'd rather be naive and experience some things than be a cynic and experience no thing. He didn't even know I was on a fast, and he prophesied to me, and he said, Brother Herring, the Holy Ghost wants me to tell you that from this day forward, there will never be another region that God sends you to on kingdom assignment, that he does not first send Michael and his angels before you to prepare the atmosphere for you to get there. But he followed it up with this, and I'll never forget it. He said, the opposition you will now face will be from people who don't want it. And so I'm going to ask you to lift your hands all over the house, and here's what's going to happen. We're going to pray the prayer of faith, and these men are going to stretch their hands across this auditorium. And when I count to three, this place is going to erupt in spiritual warfare. And you're going to respond in proportion to how bad you want this end-time revival. It's not going to be a cute little 10-second thing. It's going to be digging. It's going to be demonstrative. It's going to be warfare. And from this building, you hear me in the Holy Ghost, God's going to dispatch angels back to your cities. And pastors, the opposition and the resistance you've been facing, you're going to go home and it's going to be like the atmosphere is cleared out. Evangelist, prophets, when God sends you into a city, you're going to go and you're going to shake things up in the spirit. When I count to three, this place needs to erupt with warfare and begin to go to battle for your revival. You don't need to let me know how bad you want it. You don't need to let these men know how bad you want it. You need to let God know how bad you want it. Are you ready? Lift your hands all over the house by the authority of the Word of God and the power of the name of Jesus. We release angels from this place to go back to every city, to go with every evangelist and prophet and break the back of every strong man, we release regional dominion. 
We release the fivefold ministry. We loose the winds of revival. We command you to blow in Jesus' name. One, two, three, go, go, go. Let it out. Go, fight. Go. How bad do you want your revival? How bad do you want your revival? I release you in this house. You ought to do something you've not done in a while. You ought to get a little radical right now. Begin to fight. Go. It's about an 